Putting up to it's important we look at the facts. Why? Why? Douglas Ross is sounding pretty scared. I believe in independence. And he clapped like a seal. Hello and welcome to another Planet of Hollywood. I'm Paul Hutchin, political editor of the Daily Record. Joining me this week are Hannah Roger, who's the chief reporter of Sunday Mail, and fellow regular Douglas Dickey of the Scottish Daily Express. So let's get to it. Uh, the Horizon scandal, described rightly as one of the biggest miscarriages of justice in UK history, came up again at FMQs, as you'd expect, from Douglas Ross, the Scottish Tory leader. And I thought he made quite a good point. Um, he focused on what seems to be a difference of opinion or a difference of approach in how to give justice to the victims in this scandal. Um, First Minister Hamza Yusuf has said since last week that he wants uh, a system of exoneration for everyone who's been wronged. Um, But the Lord Advocate, who is in charge of the prosecution service in Scotland, uh, basically said that she wants a case by case um, approach uh, pursued and through the appeals court. So you can see, they're not exactly singing from the same sheet. So, start with you on this, Dougie. Is this a split here, or is it simply the Lord Advocate state in the current position, which is um, that currently the victims have got nowhere else to go other than the appeal system? Yeah, I think um, obviously the Lord Advocate's got to lay out the legal situation, and perhaps the legal situation in Scotland right now is that. Um, you know, we can't have this mass exoneration. Um, I know Humza Yusuf, has, to, to, to his credit, it's not often I say that on here, but to his credit, he seems keen to um, work uh, at UK-wide legislation that would get this dealt with. The Lord Advocate maybe maybe seems to think that that is a simplistic route. I know we, we did kind of touch on this last week, and obviously there's major issues here because... We're in a situation where, conceivably, someone who was at the fiddle, you know, there might have been, amidst the very many who obviously weren't, there may well have been someone who did commit a crime and there's every reason that, um, or there's every reason to believe that they could, 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 you know, could then be pardoned. And obviously the Lord Advocate doesn't, you know, doesn't want that to happen. But I think, I, I really think we're in a position here where, you know, better that, one guilty person gets off with it, then dozens of innocent people have, you know, having to wait lengthy periods of time for this case by case basis. This needs to move, you know, really, really quickly. Um, I, I, I don't think it's a great message to the victims of the scandal. Um, it can't, it surely can't fill them with much confidence that this is going to get sorted anytime soon when they see. Scottish government's top top uh, legal advisor and the first minister in completely different pages. Whether, as you say, Dorothy Bain may well come round, um, I don't know. I think I think also as well is at the post office uh, and 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 crown office. If someone does, if there is someone in the system who it turns out is 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 guilty of some sort of crime and they get away with it, to use a simplistic. Um, I think I think the Crown Office and Post Office need to accept that that's on them. That's you know that's their fault. That's their fault for pursuing these other, um, you know, uh, these uh, these other convictions. That, and, and it just it, it kind of boggles the mind that all these cases came to them and no one no one thought it's a bit odd that you know all of a sudden all these sub postmasters who've been working for the Post Office for years. Um, you know, without a a, a a bot to their name or suddenly stealing tens of thousands of pounds. I mean, it, it, yeah. it's completely it, it baffling that, no, you know, no one at the time thought, hold on a second. So, you know, if Dorothy Baines worried about the uh, reputation of the Crown Office because she doesn't want to be seen to conceivably let a criminal off, then I, I, I think she's going to need to suck that up, to be quite frank, because... Um, this needs, you know, the the real victims of of, of which probably a hundred percent are, you know, they 
they deserve uh, justice now and they don't deserve it in two years' time or however long it, um, it may take. I mean, I've just popped that for thin air. But, you know, however long it may take to go through each one uh, case by case. Um, Hannah, the First Minister has said clearly he wants a unique solution which will involve MSPs effectively voting for uh, UK-wide legislation. But uh, in the last half hour, a source from the UK government has been in touch. I'll just read out the source quote. Um, we need to avoid unrealistic expectations that Westminster will simply legislate on Holyrood's behalf. This is a hugely complex area and it might not be possible in the best way forward. It was reassuring to hear from the First Minister that the Scottish Government is actively drawing up Holyrood legislation. It may be that's the most appropriate solution. Um, so you've got a situation where the UK government is not exactly keen on a UK-wide solution, yet the Scottish government, which is um, always very uh, keen to do their own thing, wants to be deferring uh, to Westminster. So it seems, is there a past the parcel going on here? Look, the whole, uh, you know, we can get into what you've just mentioned there, but the whole issue is with this, right? You've got legally complex situations where some of the cases are already going through the court process. Um, I was in court last Friday in Edinburgh to see um, Rab Thompson and there was uh, um, another uh, convicted sub-postmaster who, who went to jail. And their appeals are being heard right now and you know they were very frustrated because the protest is now just still being continued, but we also heard in court that potentially because of the Prime Minister's update, it may actually be more beneficial for them to abandon the appeal to get their convictions quashed and just follow this right. other scheme. I mean, the thing is a mess, but essentially we've got pub massive public outrage about this scandal, finally, <laughs> good. But then you've got the politicians who are all fighting with each other, trying to show that they're doing something because the public are so angry. But that action does not marry up with what can actually happen legally. And everyone is confused about how this is going to go. I mean, I had a conversation with the Crown Office last week where, you know, sources within the Crown Office were even confused when Rishi Sunak announced the thing, how it was going to play out in Scotland. I think this is the problem. People do not know how you know this legislation is going to work and then on to your point this just adds another layer of shite onto it basically because as you say we've got Westminster now bizarrely saying that they don't want the legislation to apply UK wide I mean you know and that I honestly I could go on about this all all day but that what we're talking about now is only for the people who were convicted. And we have to remember, actually, there was thousands of people who were never actually prosecuted, but who repaid huge sums of money, uh, who lost their jobs and their businesses, some of whom, as I reported um, in the Sunday Mail, it was our front page at the weekend, some of whom have now passed away, partially to do with the complete terror and stress which just had a detrimental impact on their lives. You know, so while, yes, it's very important that the people who were wrongfully convicted uh, have their convictions overturned, and on Doogie's point, I would say, to be honest, I would take a couple of people who have actually stolen money being exonerated as well, because I think that, you know, I just think that the public would probably support that too. But you've got that. Um, but there's there's nothing for the people who were not convicted. There's no mention of them at the moment. And I think that's a massive area that nobody is looking at and nobody is paying attention to. So just, just coming to that, Hannah, obviously this shouldn't be a story about squabbling politicians. It's about no. ordinary people who have been wronged, either convicted or, as you say, basically driven to an early death through stress, mm -hmm. through being wrongly persecuted. So you had the splash in the Sunday Mail at the weekend, the very powerful story. Just talk us through that. Yeah, I mean, it, it's just, it's, it's one of the most horrendous 
um, stories that I've reported on and coming from me, that's quite a lot because I do tend to write pretty horrendous stories. But, you know, it's a, a woman who, Fiona McGowan, she had three children. Um, she ran, she was a sub postmaster of Jock's Lodge Post Office in Edinburgh. And the familiar story to anyone who's followed the Horizon scandal, you know, discrepancies started appearing in the finances, etc. Um, and eventually she was accused of stealing around £30,000. Her then partner repaid the post office £30,000, uh, but she was still charged with false accounting. Um, so she was charged with false accounting in around 2004, um, and she believed that she was going to be prosecuted you know, end up in court and potentially end up in jail. The she lost. They obviously lost the post office. She lost her job, um, and then she, you know, her mental health suffered. Her physical health. She um, developed. Well, she she turned to alcohol. Um, she was on antidepressants, and eventually she died of an accidental overdose, a combination of I think the antidepressants and the um, alcohol. And she was not prosecuted. I, I, there's a bit of a, it's not quite clear as to when the, the charges were dropped against her. I don't know if it was after her death or if it had actually taken place while she was still alive, but she was never informed that she wasn't going to be prosecuted. So she died believing that she was gonna end up in court and potentially in jail for something that she had not done. And there's absolutely nothing for her children, you know, her mm. children are really seeking justice and they want somebody to clear their mum's name. Mm. Um, you know, I just think it's it's absolutely appalling. And, you know, I know that this is not their, their, they're not doing this for compensation, but I think anyone in the right mind would look at that and say those three children are entitled to compensation because they believe that the post office killed their mother. You know, so and... People like that, they feel like this system of exoneration shouldn't just apply to people who've been convicted, but people who are sort of hounded to an early grave. Well, yeah, and yeah, basically, you know, and I think it's important because in Fiona's case specifically, and, and we've heard this in other cases, members of the local community, obviously the, the local press, etc., would have written stories about the, the conviction or the accusations, etc., at the time. Mm. And then the local community would then believe that these people were were thieves. And they were, you know, there's huge backlash in the community towards these people who were completely innocent of what they were being accused. And I think it it it's a huge thing for these people to actually have their names cleared. Um, and, you know, in Fiona's case, but also we know that there are other cases where people have sadly died before this is, you know, come before they can get any justice. Yeah, no, it was a very uh, moving and horrific story. Um, no doubt there are many more like that. I think you could. Um, I, think, I think you're right, Hannah. I'm simply focusing people who have been convicted is wrong. You need, it has to be wider than that. Well, yeah, because there are, it's not just convictions. And I, I'm not saying it takes, of course, people who were convicted, some people spent lengthy terms in jail, etc. Of course, they should be exonerated. But there are people who lost everything. You know, they were made bankrupt. They um, lost the business and their jobs. All of that destroyed. And, you know, they, they they maybe were not prosecuted by the post office because they repaid some of the money. And that is not being addressed by the politicians at all. Um, second issue, Dougie, certainly you, higher education. I, I was a bit surprised that this didn't come up, FMQs. It was actually, it was a story earlier this week, but I think it first came up in December. Um, Scottish government's draft budget, they have cut the funding for Scottish students going to university. Um, now, my view is that this is part of a wider story of the current funding model for universities being broken. And we talk about so-called free higher education, but it's all premised upon a cap on the number of places for Scottish students, 
And so universities basically uh, get a lot of their money from uh, overseas students. Um, what do you make of the, the cut and the wider issue of how we fund unis? Yeah, I was, um, Paul, I was stunned it wasn't brought up at FMQs today. Actually, I was really surprised. Um, I, I, you know, I'd already kind of prepared myself for that to be the story. But, uh, yeah, it's a bit of a another another one the SNP seem to have tried to bury, you know, bury in the budget papers. Uh, Alex Salmon, you know, famously said, rocks will melt with the sun. If, uh, you know, before Scott Sampton entitled to free, uh, you know, kind of, higher edu further education I, I don't think rocks are going to melt yet because it seems you know they'll continue with the policy but i think a simple fact is that the, the idea that higher education is now open to all scots of all backgrounds and of all um you know parts of the country is is increasingly becoming a myth um obviously the, the, the you know the smp argue it's it's 1200 places I think we all expect that to be more. They say that, that these were places that were created during COVID to deal with the fact that um, kids coming out of school had much better marks because they didn't need to do exams. Um, I read I, I read a piece by Alec Massey this morning. I thought he made a really good point. Uh, it, it's as if the SNP are deciding that the children who left school in 2020 and 2021, 2022, are, 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 are somehow more worthy of places at university than those leaving now. Uh, and the fact of the matter is, th th this is th this is the system the SNP have, have chosen and it's working. It, it, it works the way that it's designed to work, but it's not making higher education, or further education, sorry, I keep saying higher education, further education Scotland more accessible to people. But it's not it's not really designed to, it's, it, it's a good slogan to stick on a, a bit of stone, mm. but the fact is that um, it, 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 it's it's a system designed to fund education through bringing in foreign students or students from from um, from England. It's not actually designed for Scottish students, and you know, a Scottish university looks at it, and you know, someone coming from abroad is, is probably worth in terms of funding. One person from abroad is probably worth three or four Scottish students. So you can understand why, uh, you know, further education establishments are, 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 are eager to bring these people in from abroad. I, I think the student population of Scotland, especially in, 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 in the kind of uh, top, top echelons of the university league table, you know, your St Andrews, your Edinburgh's, your Aberdeen's, your Glasgow's. I mean, I think you're talking maybe only half of the students going to these places are from Scotland and maybe even less. So I, 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 I just think unis are being disincentivized to give places to Scottish students and uh, it's an SNP promise that they've actually stuck to, but it, it, it's had, you know, the consequences of it. Mm. And we're always going to be the consequences that, that they've been, but they're, no, they're probably not the consequences that, yeah, consequences that the SNP wanted to come to light. But the simple fact of the matter is, I, I, I don't think it, 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 it's another sign that education probably isn't much of a priority for the Scottish government because we've already seen the performances on 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 kind of school level education, and now it, it, it's just a case of let's bring foreign students in to to fund our universities and Scottish students. Well, fuck. I mean, Hannah, do you? Do you accept this idea that um, maybe free higher, higher education was well-intentioned, but it is having the sort of, um, sort of unintentional, unintentional consequence of disadvantaging Scottish students because there is this cap and it's quite difficult to get into university. Um, right now we hear many stories of, you know, maybe bright kids from what we call more... Um, Prosperous areas struggling just now. Prosperous areas or not prosperous? Yeah, prosperous areas, because I think there are statistics showing that the Scottish government has quite a good record in recent years in terms of the access agenda. But mm. because of still this cap, it's having a knock-on effect on kids with good grades from, as I 
what I described as more prosperous areas. Well, to do neighbourhoods. Like yeah, okay. I mean, I think that we shouldn't jump to any sort of, you know, con not necessarily conclusions, but we shouldn't immediately say, oh, that's it, you know, the the policy of free higher education is doomed and, you know, this is its downfall. I think that obviously we have had a very uniquely challenging set of circumstances over COVID, which are going to kind of skew the figures um, in a sense. But I think, I don't know, I mean, I'm kind of interested in what you all think about the idea of means testing in terms of, you know, it, should we just be giving free higher education to everyone or should it be that those from the wealthiest families maybe do have to contribute to like tuition? I, I, I mean, my, my own view, I think that um, there should always be a, a balance between state, which would fund most of the higher education and then a contribution from the graduate, not the student, not up front, but the graduate, once you've got your degree and you earn a certain amount. We had that. that we had that under the, the Labour Lib Dems with the graduate endowment. That wasn't really paying for tuition, that was paying for grants. But I just think yeah. in 2024, um, to expect the tax to be the full cost when you know, when you have a degree, it's essentially a passport to a better life. Your earnings are probably going to well, be higher. Is it? Well, yeah. You know, you well, can I get a degree in everything these days. You can get a degree right. in journalism. Well, I I still think there is a, a gap. I mean, I don't think the gap is as big, the earnings gap is as big as it was, but I still think there is a gap. Mm. Um, I, I don't think it's unreasonable to ask for a, a modest graduate contribution um, at some point. But is Scottish politics ready to even have that debate? It's become, I just think, free higher education has become the shibboleth that you just can't touch it. It's become yeah. a slogan on a bit of stone, which incidentally, I think Harriet Watt uh, took down after complaints from the yeah. student body. It's an amusing story. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I, I can't see it happening. Can you? No. I think, I think sorry, Anna, could you ask me as well? Just see, I, I, I was somebody who went to uni um, and didn't need to pay fees, so I, I've got a bit of cheek to say this, but I went to uni at a time where everyone went to uni. It was, they were just throwing courses at you, and if you didn't go to uni, you were almost, you know, your school would kind of look at you with, a, with an eyebrow raised. But mm. I, 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 I think Hannah made a good point. I, I, I don't think uni is necessarily a guaranteed passport to a better life. And I actually think the country's obsession with tertiary education stops kids exploring other avenues that they could go down. Um, you know, some, some 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 pupils might benefit more from going straight into work or going into apprenticeship schemes. Yeah, I, I still think there's this image that oh, you've got to go to uni to make it. Yeah. And, and yeah, I think I think that that. Yeah, I, I agree there is that sort of social pressure. Um, uh, but I, I'd be kind of loath to get in a situation where you know, university is for the children uh, or, or, or people from private schools. Yeah. And, you know, everyone else can just fight for the jobs. Um, no, absolutely. No, I don't think anyone's su suggesting that yeah, we return to that. But I think that there was... To... Sorry, there you go. No, I was just going to say, like, from what Doogie was saying, I think there really was, like, a massive boom of people all going to university. Um, and I feel like that's kind of... There's still a lot of people going, and you're getting more and more degree subjects that don't necessarily require to be... You know, you don't need a, to go and do a degree in um, nail artistry. For example, not that I'm not saying anything against people who are nail technicians. I think it's actually a very skilled job, but you do not need a degree in that subject. I would even argue, to be honest, you do not need a degree to go and become a journalist. I think it's far more valuable to gain experience on the job than it is le learning about 
news values and how to interview somebody in a lecture theatre. You know, you cannot do that unless you're actually out in the field doing it. So I think there's this, there's been this sort of tendency to push everything towards um, academia and the, how would you, do you, do you understand what I'm saying? Mm. You know, to make things that don't need to be degrees into degrees in order for people to then go to university. And then you've got this problem of having to fund places. You've got students who, you know, are having to have loans for living costs and all the rest of it. And sometimes it isn't necessary. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I'm not suggesting that people do not go to university unless they're very wealthy and then everyone else just fights for the jobs. That's not what I'm saying at all. So basically we're just gonna, I mean, the politicians are probably just going to keep this trundling along, aren't they, without making any sort of big changes. No. There's, there's no there's no incentive really to tamper with this system at all. It's just mm. going to be um, stasis. Um, final, final issue. There was a big poll earlier this week uh, for Westminster. It predicted a huge Labour majority, a 97 style majority of, I think, 120, which would be yeah. a remarkable result given uh, Labour's traumatic result in 2019. I don't know about you, Hannah, but I, I keep thinking that the polls are going to narrow. I keep thinking, well, Labour's lead is soft. It's, it's going to narrow to about five or six points, but it doesn't seem to be happening. This big lead appears to be quite robust. Yeah, and I also feel like it's kind of widening rather than narrowing. Do you not? <laughs> yeah, I mean, if, you know, depending on which poster you're, you're looking at. I mean, it's, well, yeah, but it just 18, seems... 18, 20 points. I, mean, I think so, yeah. Yeah, it just seems that nothing is really kind of shifting it away from Labour and back to the Tories. Um, I think it's very interesting. Also, if you look at the sort of the details for all the sort of uh, data geeks like me and sad people who like to spend their Friday nights looking at spreadsheets and things. Um, you know, if you look at the details of this poll, it's not just the numbers, but it's actually the uh, the individual seats that potentially could be lost um, from the Tories. So you've got people like Jeremy Hunt is predicted to lose a seat, Penny Morden, uh, David Davis, who's, you know, a veteran who's been around and actually, you know, for the Tories, David Davis is is all right at times. Um, you, you know, mentioned a long list of uh, politicians there. Obviously, Sunday Mail, Daily Record, no fans of the Tories. What would be, Hannah, your Pertillo moment? What do you mean? I'm like, you don't know what I mean? Like, 97, it's one of the great sort of moments was when Pertillo lost his seat. Uh-huh. And it was just a sign that... Oh, the you mean, like, who would I say would be the Pertillo? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, in terms of one of the, the big beasts losing their seats uh, at the general election, what would be the Portillo moment this time around? I think, well, out of the list that I've got, it's, you know, of those predicted, it would probably be somebody like Jeremy Hunt. But if I could, you know, pick any, pick anyone yes, to lose anyone. Seats, Oh, who would it be? Um, Reese Mogg would be good, but he's not going to lose his seat. I was going to say, it would be somebody like Reese Mogg, or how about how about how about um, braver men would be good as well one of the nasty ones what about pretty patel she seems like yesterday's news yeah but it would still be a, a big deal it would be a big deal yeah let's face it there's probably quite a few michael contenders. gove michael gove he has. I don't think he's one of the worst ones. I don't. What I, I'm, not, I'm not. I'm not a fan. I'm not a fan. But I think there's a lot worse than him. Really, really. I just. I don't know. I, I think like because a lot of the the sort of really divisive ones, like obviously Boris Johnson, the Dean Dorries, etc., they've all buggered off. So I'm trying to think. I mean, the Tories these days are apart from people like Lee Anderson, etc., you know, they're not there's not I don't uh, know. Yeah, I think Reese Mogg Reese Mogg yes, would yeah. be my Portillo moment. Dougie, obviously if these folk lost their seats you'd be in the toilet with your head in your hands crying. Um 
what's your view of the opinion polls? I mean, the, do you think this poll lead is going to persist for another few months? No, but not. I don't think it will be because Labour will lose support. I think the polls have been a little bit skewed by the uh, what it's predicting that reform are going to pick up. Mm. Uh, you know, they're talking about eight, nine, ten percent. I don't see that on polling day. I think you'll get a lot of Tory voters who might say right now that they're angry with the Tories. Um, the, 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 you know, want to um, give them give them a kicking, but when the but when the push comes to shove, and and the sanctity of the polling booth, I think they would. Um, uh, I think they would uh, probably pro probably give their tick. So I think I think reformer maybe realistically maybe on five four or five percent. So I don't think it will be a Tony Blair landslide. Sir Keir Starmer is going to be the next PM. I don't have any doubts about that. Um, but I, I, I would just take them with a wee pinch of salt right now. Well, well, the you know reformer are, are pulling so high because I just I can't see them getting that sort of return. I, I agree with you know. actually. I think I think the the reform issue is kind of critical because if, if they do well, there's just you know that just blocks any sort of revival for the Tories, but. Election day. I think in, in the, the most recent poll, the YouGov one that we're talking about, reform was not predicted to pick up any seats. No, but it's going to, people are going to vote them. Yeah, but there was up. actually a, a sort of, um, again, because I'm a nerd and read all the, you know, supporting information, they did say, you know, if reform, you know, was, if people who were wanting to vote, if reform was not in the race, basically, People are not; those people are still not likely to vote for the Tories. They believe that they'll go to either UKIP, some of the splinter, was it UKIP? Some of the splinter, other splinter parties, or some would go to Labour. They did not believe that those votes would go to the Tories. So, a wee bit they, more might go to the Tories now after the Rwanda bill passed. Mm -hmm. I wonder if that's maybe settled some nerves amongst Tory voters down yeah. south. It's a bit, it's just, I know you didn't ask me, Paul, but uh, John Nicholson would be my Portillo moment. <laughs> uh, so he's your so, sort of reverse Portillo, okay? Yes, yes, absolutely. So uh, I look forward to that. John Nicholson, poor John yeah, Nicholson. He's he's, uh, he's blocked the Scottish Express on on Twitter. He's one of four SNP MPs who can't take it. So what a shameful action. Stuart Hosey's um, Stuart Hosey's standing down, and other two are nobodies. So um, it's going to be rise trying. above it. Rise above it. <laughs> We're going to discuss Rwanda, but we're running out of time. So let's go straight to uh, good week, bad week. Start with you, Hannah. Well, mine actually does cover Rwanda. So my bad week is poor old Lee Anderson, who um, he ended up giving up his uh, position in the Tories so he could vote against the government in the Rwanda bill, not because he didn't think not because he thought it was unacceptable what the government was proposing, but because he thought it wasn't uh, strong enough, which I find absolutely bonkers. But after after giving up his position and also the Tories winning the vote anyway, so his you know his actions were totally pointless. He then revealed this morning that he went into the no lobby uh, to vote against the government and all the Labour MPs were picking on him and, and joking that he should just join the Labour Party and see, he said he couldn't do it and he ended up abstaining from the thing that he he resigned his post for. I mean, you just, it's, it's just nuts. Um, so yes, Lee Anderson has not had the best week um, and Dougie, you will not be surprised at my good week, <laughs> which is... Good old Keir Starmer. Six episodes in a row. I haven't been here six episodes in a row. No, but I think this is actually quite a good week for Keir Starmer. You've got the Tories all fighting with each other and you've got this Labour poll or this poll which shows Labour, you know, miles ahead. So, you know, I may as well go for the obvious choice. If it's Douglas okay, Ross, okay, okay, I, just... I would say it. We just heard from uh, Keir's Scottish spokeswoman. <laughs> about you, Dougie? Good week, bad week? Well, I'll, I'll, I'll I mean, I'm obviously not shocked at all at Hannah's choice, but <laughs> I, I, 
I am going to shock everyone by giving my good week to drumroll, please, Humza Yusuf. So, um, the well, not, where's the snidey comment? Come on, no, no, of course, not not just Humza Yusuf, but MSPs as a whole who've uh, been granted a big fat pay rise this week. Uh, it makes Humza the uh, best paid politician in the UK, I think. He, he's he's, ent- he's entitled to more anyway than uh, than. And Rishi Sunak, so even though things maybe aren't going his way, he's got his uh, piles of cash and a uh, nice house in Broughty Ferry and private education, a real man of the people to keep him. Um, to keep I should him, say, I'm from Broughty Ferry, but I'm not privately educated. So, oh, so. <laughs> well, Broughty Ferry is very nice, it's a very nice place, but uh, no, I mean, it's uh, obviously been another difficult week for him, but at least he's got his. Um, 6.7%, I think it was, um, mm. pay, uh, pay rise to cheer him up, as have the rest of the MSPs. And for bad week, we had said he'd move away from politics for a wee bit. It's not been a great week for the royals, for the royal family. Uh, Princess Kate, obviously, in hospital for two weeks to recover from abdomen surgery, which is, you know, certainly get people speculating it's quite a long recovery period. And mm. obviously, uh, the king's... Uh, the king is going to go into hospital next week to have uh, some procedure done to his prostate. Um, whether that will uh, help out his uh, enlarged fingers remains to be seen. But um, I'm sure, I'm sure we all wish them well. Uh, I certainly do wish them a speedy recovery, and hopefully they're back in their feet soon. All right. Well, thank you again, comrades. It's been brilliant. Uh, thanks for your analysis and insight. I hope that uh, everyone enjoyed it and I hope you tune in again next week. So thanks and bye. Think after, it's important we look at the facts. Why? Why? Douglas Ross is sounding pretty scared. I believe in independence. And he clapped like a seal.